welcome to episode 5 of What Do You Say with DDJ. As always, I am your host, DDJ. Uh, this week's episode is a very special one, not only because it is episode 5, and 5 is kind of the first landmark number on uh, these types of things, um, but I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, my guest this week is none other than former NWA World Heavyweight Champion and current member of the NWA roster, Tim Storm. Uh, just kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to episode five of What Do You Say with DDJ, and with me tonight is my very special guest, the former NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and he actually holds the distinct honor of being the oldest man to win the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, uh, Mr. Tim Storm. Tim, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing fantastic, man. Uh, yeah, thank you for letting me be here. I always look forward to visiting and talking about wrestling. It's it's one of my it's my passion. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time to uh, chat with me. Like I, we, we were just discussing right before I, we, uh, I started recording, I can't tell you how excited I was when I got you to agree to come on. So I I'm, think I'm going to have just as much fun, if not more, than, I, than any episode I've done so far. Well, I, I, I told you, I, I look at this like uh, we're all on the same team, trying to get to the same place. And, uh, you know, I, I just I, I would encourage – everybody to support wrestling in any shape or form uh so hey man we're we're trying to get to the same place so i'm i'm i'm, I'm i appreciate you having me on all right thank you so much all right so my first question is for you is who is tim storm like what who was tim storm what was what was it like growing up uh you know i grew up in in pine bluff arkansas which you know it, it, actually i started i started announcing being from pine bluff arkansas as the NWA world's champion, I wanted to represent, represent my hometown. Uh, you know, I wrestled a lot here. I'm, I live in the Dallas area and I always, as a local guy living here, I always kind of announced myself from Dallas, Texas, you know, kind of get that cheap home pop. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the point that I won the NWA world's heavyweight championship, I started announcing from Pine Bluff and, and the advantage for me, uh, you know, I think I, I, I told you this. I think that all of us start off as fans for the most part. You know, it's we have we fall in love with wrestling, whether whatever aspect that is. But growing up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, uh, it was centrally located. So for me, what that meant is every Saturday morning I could get, you know, Memphis wrestling. So I got Lawler and Dundee and the Boogie Woogie Man and Kamala, you know, all those guys. Um, in the afternoon, I got the NWA, I got, uh, you know, TBS Superstation, I, and, and that was, that's the NWA, that was the Four Horsemen, uh, you know, Animal, I mean, it's, it's, it was a who's who of wrestling, I loved that, um, and then at night, I got world class, so I got the Von Erichs and the Freebirds, and I mean, so I had, I had the opportunity to see wrestling as a 10, 11, 12 year old kid, and I got to see different aspects of it, different styles of wrestling. And I just fell in love with, with wrestling. And, and that's where one of my passions for the NWA comes from is I love the NWA. To me, that was, that was the best of the best. Awesome. Now, who, was there anybody in particular that got you into wrestling or did you just kind of stumble across it on your own? No. Uh, and it's kind of funny because my mom still will say, I don't like when I, when I would talk about what I just said, she would go, I don't remember that. I don't remember you watching wrestling. Uh, I don't know what that says, but you know, I, I, she tells a story about my uh, grandmother that would watch wrestling on TV and now realize my mom is 95, which means that, you know, if they were living, my grandparents would be what, 130, 140. you know, so we're talking black and white TV, three channels, but she would talk about, uh, you know, if she walked in front of the TV while wrestling was on, my, my grandmother would go, I bet they heard me because she thought that they could hear. But since she could hear them, they thought that they could hear her. But nobody really influenced me into watching it. Um, I just found it. And I have always considered myself somewhat of an athlete. 
and just the the athlete, the entertainment value, the athleticism. Uh, it was just a it was just a great combination. Awesome. So, who were some of your early favorites? You mentioned a lot of guys just now, but like, who were some of the ones that like really you you, you felt connected to? I connected early on watching, and again, now now I'm and, and honestly, I'm. I'm not naming NWA people on purpose, but um, <laughs> I connected early on to Harley Race uh, just as a legitimate tough guy. And then the one that really hooked me uh, was Dusty Rhodes. And it, you know, I made this comment the other day. It never occurred to me that Dusty Rhodes didn't have a physique. That, I, that never fit into my thoughts at all. But probably by the time I was 12 or 13, uh, I was, you know, I was doing my Dusty impression. Uh, and I knew, you know, in my mind, I knew every dusty quote, you know, 265 pounds of screaming steel and sex appeal, you know, all, all of those things. And just the, the, the charisma and the personality and being, and I just, it just brought me in and, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, but those dusty Rhodes is the first one that just hooked me and got me in. Mm, awesome. So when did you uh, make the decision from to not only just be a fan, but what, when did you decide you wanted to get into the business? I didn't, I didn't make, I didn't pull the trigger on that until I was 30, 31. Okay. Uh, which is an age where a lot of guys are getting out of the business. You know, they've, if you start at 19 or 20, you've been in the business 10 or 11 years and you've either beaten your body, you know, to death or, you know, you've made, you've taken your shot and it didn't pay out, whatever. And um, I was the vice president of a company in Sherwood, Arkansas. And I had, I had been playing, I don't, I don't know what the right term would be, but, you know, very, a very competitive level of slow pitch softball where we had won, you know, a couple of state championships we had. And I just decided I wanted to do something different. I wanted a new challenge. Uh, my knees were starting to bother me. And I don't know why I picked professional wrestling thinking that would save my knees, but <laughs> I, I made the first phone call uh, to uh, WCW power plant and had some discussions with them. And I was officially, I was too old to even go to the camp, um, but they would, they would have been willing to take my money, uh, I, you know, cause that's, it, it really was, it was a, it was a, for, in a, in a, in the big picture of things, it was a way to make money. Um, and while I was in the process of that, a friend of mine said, you know, from church, actually, he goes, he goes, hey, listen, I saw this commercial for a local TV and they advertised a wrestling school. Um, he goes, I'm going to be honest with you. He said the production values were not good at all. But he said, I know that, I mean, I, was, I wasn't going to walk away from my vice president position and just and start wrestling because, I, you know, I had house payment, I had car payments, I had two kids, you know, I had, I had life commitments. But I made a phone call, and this was about two hours, two and a half hours from my home, so that, that wasn't bad at all. And I thought, you know, what's, what's the worst that can happen? I'm going to give this a shot, and I'm a pretty decent athlete. And I thought I was old at the time, but I was, a, you know, I was young enough to get in there and do it. And, it, you know, it's worked, out, it's worked out pretty well 26 years later. I would definitely agree with that. So let's talk about um... – Dude, like I so said, doing my research uh, leading up to this, you know, I, you spent a lot of your early career in Texas. Uh, talk about what that was like going through, you know, the independent promotions in Texas and what you learned there. I think, I think the independent, independent wrestling in general is the lifeblood of wrestling uh, in a lot of cases. And I know, I know there are a lot of uh, recruiting going on by uh, the big companies to bring guys in from, from, that are athletes from other sports. And that's great, too. But, you know, if you go back into the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was, there, you know, the territories was the learning ground. It's where you went to, to wrestle and you got experience. And, and when I do clinics and camps now, I tell guys all the time that one of the things that's missing is the opportunity to wrestle in front of, to, well, you know, back then it was potentially every night, sometimes twice every, you know, on the weekends. Uh, so you could go six or seven nights a week in front of different audiences and get different responses and de wrestle different guys. That's gone now. But, you know, for me coming into Texas and the independence, I had walked away. I had, when I moved here, I took a, another vice presidency uh, of a company and decided it was probably time to stop chasing the dream and thought I was done with wrestling. And that lasted about eight or nine months. And I was right back in deeper than ever. Um, 
but that's, that's your learning ground, you know, and I was very fortunate. Arkansas had a couple of decent promotions. Texas has an abundance of opportunity. And even, even like today, there are some, obviously without the COVID, there are some prime great promoters here that run great shows that bring in a lot of talent that you draw big crowds. It's a great place to learn and it's a great place to get experience and you wrestle some of the top guys. And that all feeds into, you know, you, when you don't, you don't know it at the time, but you, you're, you're basically on a journey trying to get somewhere. And that's, that was preparing me for where I was going to go. I didn't know where that was going to be, but that was preparing me for, you know, for bigger things. And you go to bigger things. Uh, one of the things I also discovered while doing some research was that you actually had a, uh, a match and um, up in, up, you know, for the WWE as part of their ECW brand back in July of 2007 against Big Daddy V, a.k.a. King Mabel. Um, tell me, how did that come about and what was it like wrestling on, you know, on that kind of stage? You know, it's, it's one of those things where um, I, had, I had met and wrestled King Mabel maybe my – my, my first, no, my very first night uh, of my first experience with TV wrestling was for Harley Race up in Missouri. And on that particular night, I had, I had already wrestled Butch Reed. Um, I had a second match that I think was a handicap match. It was, or, oh, no, I'm sorry, a mixed tag. It was uh, myself and I'm trying to remember. It, it, was, it was me and maybe Lord Littlebrook against okay. another guy and uh, Little Tokyo. So it was a mixed tag with, with a midget wrestler and, a, and a, you know, a, another guy. And, then, and I thought I was done for the night. And Harley walked up and he said, uh, you know, and, I, and again, realize I said this early, he was one of my early influences. So for just being there, being around, being around him was intimidating and, and great all at the same time. But he walked up and, he, and I was doing a cowboy gimmick and he goes, uh, say cowboy, you'd be willing to work a, a, a match with uh, with King Mabel at the end. He said, "We we want to add a TV match." And I went, "Absolutely." So I had worked King Mabel my first night of TV. Well, now here we go. Whatever it is, seventeen, fifteen years later, uh, and and we're you know, I think all of us in wrestling, you you get these visions in your head of of your goals and where you want to go, and and until the last five or six years. Uh, really there was only before, you know, after WCW, there was really just one big company and you were, you wanted a shot. Um, so I was doing the loop. I was going and doing, you know, extra work, supplemental talent, uh, whatever on a, on a fairly regular basis, trying to get an opportunity. And, and that was just one of those nights where they, they put me, it was on, it was live TV with ECW. It was when they were taping, uh, the ECW brand along with maybe SmackDown, maybe I can't remember. Okay. So they would just take, they'd take a break, change the ring out, change the apron, change the ropes and keep the taping going in front of the live audience. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a good experience. It was, it made me understand that I, I, I could, that I belonged on a different level than just the independence. It, you know, the match was what 56 seconds and I did exactly what I was supposed to do. Um, dislocated shoulder and broken nose and everything else, but that's just part of the business, you know, and that, a lot of damage in those, in those under a minute, but it was a good experience. And it's one that I, a lot of guys have had. You're just looking for a job. You're looking for an opportunity. Awesome. Now, did you get any uh, feedback from anyone after that match? And if so, what yeah. was it? Well, I did. And that was, it, it, it was, it was all positive. I'll put it that way. Okay. Um, I walked through the curtain and the first person that met me in the curtain was Dusty Rhodes. And, you know, they had, it was kind of a period where they had gone away from using extras, using supplemental talent um, for a long period of time. And they were just starting to do it again. So I think there was a little bit of concern about, you know, doing that. They were iffy on whether they wanted to start doing it again and I think that I, you know, I think I did a good enough job in getting my butt kicked that they were happy, you know, and anyway, I walked through the curtain and Dusty Rhodes shook my hand and he goes, you know, you know, great job, kid. Now, again, I've just brought up the two people that were big influences on me, right? So Harley Race and now Dusty Rhodes. Um, I had a guy pull me off and I'm not, I don't want to name names, but I had a guy pull me off and he goes, 
why are you, he said, why are you not under contract with us? Wow. And I was very honest. You know, I said, um, you know, I've got a wife and two kids. I have not been willing up to this point to make that commitment and walk away from my responsibility for my families. And this is, this guy was a super nice guy. And he goes, that's a great answer. He said, you, he didn't say I had a contract. So don't get me wrong. I didn't walk away from a contract. Uh, but he goes, you belong here and you should pursue it if that's where you want to do. Uh, that was, that was good. You know, overall, it was a really good experience. Uh, you know, I have people now that when I, when I, when I broke through to this public, you know, the one that you and I talked about that a lot of people didn't know who I was until three or right. four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, my very first thing for the new era of NWA for, for Billy Corgan, for those, for those guys was out at uh, championship wrestling from Hollywood. And I cut a promo in the ring where I said, this is my mountaintop and that's legitimate. It act, you know, the NWA world's title to me was the highest I could ever be. And some of the feedback that I would get from people was, Oh no, no. If New York called, you'd be gone in a second. Um, and here's the, here's the thing. Now, I don't, I'm glad I got that opportunity and I got that experience. It did, it did some things for my confidence and it, it you know, it, it gave me a place, but were I given that opportunity today to do a 46 second squash match with somebody, I, I now I wouldn't do it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a different world, different time. Not that I would get that opportunity. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying everybody, when you're young and you're looking for a shot, absolutely. Later on in life, especially when you want to protect what whatever bit of legacy you've got not as you know not as big a thing gotcha so what um so you kind of alluded to where actually where i was wanting to go with my next question you mentioned the nwa what um made you t decide to uh go to the nwa like what was it someone on a recommendation or someone reach out i you know i have i have been working with the nwa for a long time before any of this. And um, those, those three letters, when I, when I stand on NWA power or 10 pounds of gold and I talk about what the NWA meant, means to me, meant to me and means to me, that's legit. Uh, those letters have always been special. To me, that was the best of the best in wrestling. Maybe, and I don't, I, I never know the time period for, for sure, but maybe 10 or 12 years ago, um, I was at, there, there's a local, it's, it's based locally that there's a yearly meeting of people who are in wrestling and it's, it's just wrestlers and people who have been involved in business business. And it was started by uh, red Bastine. Uh, it used to be called the, 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 the Texas shootout. Now it's, it's done at the, at the uh, wrestling hall of fame every year, uh, but it's a get together of wrestlers. And I had a guy walk up to me and he was a promoter friend of mine, a guy named Robert Langdon. Um, okay. And he had a, he had another wrestler that I knew who introduced us and he literally walked up to me and he goes, I run, uh, NWA, Oklahoma and NWA, Texas. He said, I want you to be my Kerry Von Eric. And wow. again, now you're, well, now you're talking about another guy who you choose names. He hit one that was a home run for me. He goes, mm -hmm. I want you on every show. Uh, you know, and, and he's been true to that word, but he had the NWA, Oklahoma, uh, franchise. I got booked on a show maybe two weeks later. Um, I won the NWA Oklahoma or, you know, heavyweight champion at the time. And that, you know, Robert and that promotion went a long way in, in helping me build a, a reputation and a relationship with the NWA ownership. But I told a friend of mine, then I said, I don't know what I can do. Um, but if there's anything I can do to bring the NWA back, NWA back to the prominence that I grew up with, I want to do that because that's important to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it very quickly moved to on my priority list as a number one priority. And that's, and that's way before anybody knew who I was before 10 pounds of gold, before NWA power, before becoming NWA world champion. I just, the NWA was my heart and I just wanted to see if I could help. Awesome. Um, okay. So we're going to fast forward to October 21st, 2016. And, uh, and I'm sure you probably remember that date on um, for, but for those that don't, uh, what was it like going into that after the, after you had beaten Jack Stane for the NWA title, what was going through your mind that night? Well, you know, coming into that, um, I had wrestled Jack's, I don't know, 
a bunch, six or eight times. Uh, and I, we had, maybe we had a few that were no contest or double DQs, but for the most part, Jax beat me. Uh, I know he beat me in Las Vegas twice, uh, once for the world title, once for, he beat me when I had the North American title. Uh, he unified belts at that point. I know he beat me for in uh, Las Ve uh, Vegas twice, Mississippi once. We had, we'd had a history. Uh, and that, to me, that's a testament to how good of a champion he is or was. Uh, because he didn't have to give me another title shot. And then when he did it, he came literally into my home field, my home court advantage. So I had my fans and my promotion. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, I had, I had, I had people with it with semi message saying, Oh man, that's congratulations. That's great. You deserved it. And the only answer I could get is who deserves that. Right. I mean, if, if that is your, if that's the thing that you're the promotion, the NWA, is, is the pinnacle for you to become the NWA world's heavyweight champion. Uh, how do you, how can you, I, I could never justify deserving that. So then I made it, I made it a point. Okay. Well, I, I don't know if I deserved it or not, but I'm going to do everything I can to uphold the honor and the legacy. I knew one thing, cause I didn't know, you, know, you said it was in 2016. So I, I guess I was 53 at the time. You said it, you said it on the introduction and I didn't know it that night, but I broke, Luthez's record as the oldest man to hold the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. Again, I didn't know that at the time, but I didn't know how – you never know how long you're going to hold a title, uh, especially one of that, you know, history and legacy. I knew one thing, though. Um, they couldn't take my name off that list, right? I mean, once I had won it, I was on a list of people that, to me, is a who's who of professional wrestling, a list of Hall of Famers, uh, you know, it, some of the greatest names in, in not just wrestling history – but if you look at it, even current guys, guys like uh, AJ Styles, I mean, they're, they're the top of the top. And uh, to, to put my name on that list, if I'd have held it, I mean, go back and look. I think what did Kerry Von Eric held it for two weeks. I think Giant Baba literally held it for 24 hours. Um, you know, but to put my name on that list, not knowing how long I'm going to hold it, I knew one thing. I'm on the list with those guys. And, and that alone was, was huge for me. Yeah, I remember, um, like, we were also discussing, I was telling you how I bought the NWA 10 Pounds of Gold uh, DVD set, and on the one on the insert, and it had lists everybody that's held the NWA title, and I just was in awe of reading all the names on there. You mentioned, like, yourself, um, you know, Flair, Steamboat, uh, you know, Harley Race, you mentioned Luthet, just all the guys, it's just, it's just, that had to be so cool for you to be a part of that list. Well, and I think especially from a wrestling standpoint, you know, it's – you have to be you have to be a different breed to be a professional wrestler. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have pretty high pain tolerance. You have to be willing to put up a lot of stuff. You get, a, you get a tendency to not be very emotional about things. And that particular night was an incredibly emotional night. I mean, Jax and I had, had beat each other half to death, you know, all over the country – the, our one of my best friends, who at the time was the was the head official for the NWA, he was the uh, head of talent relations for the NWA. But I, but I consider friends in the ring all at the same time when I won it, and uh, I couldn't have I couldn't have stopped the emotion if I wanted to, and I didn't want to. I mean, that was the culmination of a long a long time of you know loving wrestling and. That was, to, I don't want to say it was the payoff, but when I say it was my mountaintop, I just don't, I don't know anything that could beat that. Well, yes, yeah, you know, something like that, you know, I mean, you look at the list of men who held that title and just again, I mean, not, there's only a certain amount of people that can say they've done what you did. And I mean, right. and that's a very small list. So uh, kind of, and obviously, you know, you probably, you had a lot of title defenses, but one that I found that was, I, that in particular that I discovered you had a title defense against was Jerry the King Lawler. Uh, what was it like working with him? We, you know, we've been on a hundred shows together. Um, and I, you know, I won't say, Hey, we're friends, but we get along fine. You know, always very respectful. I've never seen an issue. And that was just a deal. My answer, especially as a world champion, your job is to put people in seats, right? Well, that was a match that we knew would put people in seats. We knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the experience was great. You know, I mean, I don't, I couldn't tell you how old he is today. That was maybe 
I don't know, two years ago, two and a half years ago. It was about like three, two, three years ago, yeah. something like that. And, but I mean, the, the man, I mean, still looks great. He looks just like he did 30 years ago. You know, if he's, if he's whatever, if he's 68, he throws a better drop kick than I do. And that's just, that's just me laying it out there. Uh, I have nothing but good things to say about him and, and, and dealing with him on the match. It was, it was a, it was, you know, it was a, I won't say it was a high flying exhibition by either one of us, but it was a good solid match with a good story and a good finish. And I was happy with all of it. You know, I mean, I, I, anytime you walk away, it's still the world champion against somebody that's a hall of famer. That's, that's a pretty good deal. I would agree with that there. So obviously, you know, a lot of people you hear, you know, when you become the champion, like you have an insane schedule. Um, and that was one of the, again, one of the things that and I've, you'll notice I've referenced a lot, you know, 10 pounds of gold a lot. Cause it's been, it was really helpful in me doing some research. Um, so what was your schedule like as the NWA champion? Here's the way the old uh, regime was set up. Mm. They sold, <clears throat> you paid to be a franchise of the NWA. Really what you were paying is to be able to use those three letters in your promotional. And then there were requirements that had to be met. One of those requirements was you had to, you had to use one of the champions. You had to book, you had to book one of the champions, your choice three times a year. One of those was the world champion. Okay. So, if you have 50 franchises, so you're at that point, and it didn't always work out, but at that point you could look and say, well, that's 50 bookings right there in a year as the champion to defend. And that's just going to those once, you know, one time a year. Um, it was a really good schedule. I mean, it was, it was tough at times because you know, when you go in there, you're walking in with a lot of responsibility with, with what you're representing you have to walk in with uh, basically a, a, you have to be the champion. You know that you're going to get one of the best guys on their roster every time. You know that the expectation is, is that your match should be the best match of the night every time. You're always going to be the main event. The pressure's on you to put people in seats or not put people in seats, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, the pressure comes with it, but that's what you want. And if you're in any, any athletic uh, activity, if you're, if you're a basketball, Michael Jordan said he always wanted to take that last shot, right? Uh, you, you, you want to be the quarterback on the 20 yard line. That's got to go 80 yards in two minutes, right? It's, that's what you want. So I relished in that, you know, and I won't, I, you know, I'm not going to say every match was a five-star match, but I was very, I was very aware uh, of, of what my job was and, I kind of approached it with the, and again, not comparing myself in any way, but I, I tried to use the Ric Flair model, which means when I go, when I would go into every promotion, my job as I saw it was to make the guy that I wrestled, make everybody in the building believe that he could have beat me. He had a chance and that makes him better it makes the promotion better because if I'm not coming back there, they have a guy that almost became world champion that could be at the top of their roster. Um, you know, so you go in and you, you know, every night you got to give, you got to give your best effort. You got to give, you can't have a bad match. That's just the way it is. Gotcha. Um, so now, you know, uh, now Billy Corgan comes into the picture and purchases the NWA. When did you first hear about it? And did you have any concerns when you heard the news? <laughs> Yes and yes. Um, well, I mean, again, I was on uh, to be the world to to hold the world title is is a big deal, and that's a choice that the owners and the executives that are you know that, that are a part of the management team have to feel comfortable with you. We didn't know that they were even in discussion uh, about selling it, and you know the the former ownership had signed a no disclosure with, with Billy. So they couldn't talk about it. And just the way that the way that the timing of it fell, uh, and most of the fans are probably have heard of the cauliflower alley club. Mm. It has a yearly meeting in Las Vegas. It's a, it's a big deal. They do, you know, they induct people into the hall of fame. They have, it's like a three day event and it's huge. I've been to many of them that particular year. I wasn't wrestling there. Uh, you know, they have like three shows. They have th a, a big show every night and I wouldn't, I wasn't wrestling that year. So I didn't go. So I was legitimately sitting in my classroom as a teacher 
uh, on like a Friday afternoon. And I think the kids may have been taking a test. So I was sitting at my desk and my phone was on my desk and it literally just exploded. I mean, it was just, you know, I have it muted. I don't want to, I don't, it's not just, it can't be a distraction for the kids. Right. Absolutely. But it's just, it's like text, text, phone call, text, text, phone call. Because the word had leaked out that Billy Corgan was buying the NWA and the world champion was sitting at his day job, finding out just like everybody else. Uh, the NWA franchise members were at the Cauliflower Alley Club planning on having just our, our normal meetings about, you know, direction and all those kind of things. And that most of the franchises were represented. And those guys were like, okay, did you know about this? I, I had no clue. Uh, I know that I got two of my, two of my closest friends. One was James Beard again, another guy, uh, both sent me messages that, that were, they were decision makers and they said, didn't know this was coming. Um, I'm going to find out. I'll let you know. And all I could say was, Appreciate it. You know, right. I mean, my, my first thought was, well, this has been a good run. <laughs> you know I mean? New right. ownership. Um, I had never met, never met Billy before. And my thought was, I'm sure those guys, you know, I, I knew their history. I knew that they had been involved with impact and, and some different things. And I figured, okay, they're probably going to want to bring in somebody they're more familiar with somebody younger, probably, somebody who may have a, a bigger TV name. So that was my first thought. And, and my, you know, I answered myself like I normally do with whatever they want to do. I'm just going to handle this in the most professional way I know how. So whatever that was, as long as it, as long as I handled it professionally, I was going to be okay with it. Awesome. Um, so, okay. So now we're at the point where Nick Aldis is in the picture and I know you had, I believe one successful title defense against him. And then you then unfortunately you drop the title to Nick and he's gone on obviously to basically for the last almost three years combined, you know, be the NWA champion. How do you feel he's done as a represent the, as I guess the guy for the national wrestling Alliance? Impeccable. Fantastic. You know, and I don't want to, you know, it seems like I do this when somebody asks me the question, I, I don't, I don't want to make this a let, you know, let me put Nick over time, but that I don't, I don't feel like I have a choice. It's Nick is the complete package. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, you know, he's, he's every time I see him, which now has been, I don't know how many hundreds of times he's always taller than I think he is. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm six, three, Nick's probably six, four. And if you, if you see him, you don't think that, you know, um, he, dresses impeccably obviously he's, you know he's got that you know with that with that with that british accent almost anything he says sounds more intelligent than anything this guy from arkansas could say <laughs> um you know he's he can go out and cut great promos if you know for the first what first season of nwa power uh he wrestled as a face and went out and cut amazing promos had great matches had great title defenses the second season, they turned on me and I remember that that is a heel and couldn't get the promo out because the fans were booing him so much. So he he's worked he's worked both sides successfully. He's represented the company. He's carried it on his shoulders. Uh, he's a technical wizard in the ring when he wants to be. He's a brawler when he wants to be. And at six four, we'll go up to the top rope and drop an elbow. I you know again I don't want to I don't want to just make this into a, a you know, tell everybody how great Nick is, but he is, he's just that good. He's, he's a true champion. Yeah, he is. So one of the things though, going into the night you dropped the title to uh, Nick Aldis is that I believe your rib, you had some, your ribs were taped up and that was due to uh, an attack or a match you had previously had with uh, Josephus. Mm -hmm. And then basically not too long after you dropped the, the NWA title, you had an empty arena match against Josephus inside the impact zone. Uh, how did that come about, and what was that like? Uh, you know, it was just kind of the story arc. Uh, Josephus had kind of, uh, kind of the, the way it had happened was he had been ch wanting to challenge for the title. Mm. And never really got the world title shot. Um, I, I lost to Nick in New Jersey, and prior to, prior to losing – I took a couple of pretty vicious uh, ladder shots to my ribs. 
uh, out in out in LA from okay. Josephus that did some legitimate damage. Um, now, you know, as a champion, you can't make excuses. That's just not your job, right? It's I, I think because I had a lot of people say, "Are you know you you need to take you know a month or two off and get healthy?" And and my response was, "Harley Race didn't take time off, right? I mean, if you're the champion, if you're booked, you go defend the championship." So I defended the championship, and Nick beat me. That's it. No excuses. <laughs> he was, you know, he is as good as I just said he was. He beat me clean. He there was nothing else to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of the way the, the story went was Josephus started pretty much stalking and trying to get a, uh, trying to get some type of match. And the challenge was if, you know, if I, I had a, I had a title defense coming up against Nick and I wasn't going to give that up. Uh, I, I wanted my title, you know, I wanted, I wanted a, re or a rematch against, against Nick. And Josephus and his uh, spiritual advisor tried to pay a visit to my daughter uh, at, in the middle of the night. And that was kind of the, kind of what lit the fuse. And I accepted the match. I put my rematch on the line and we had that at uh, an empty arena match, which was, a, I mean, in, in retrospect, it was a great experience. Uh, one of the most challenging things I've ever done uh, at, at that point, I had done a lot of matches of almost every kind, but an empty arena match, well today, you know what? We were just ahead of our time because now it's what every match is, right? But pretty it, much. Yeah. You know, to, to wrestle in front of no fans um, in a large place with no energy to feed off of it, it, it was, you know, I took it as, okay, well, I'm just, I'm just going to be aggressive. I'm going to go after him, and I'm going to fill this lack of energy from a crowd with my own energy. Mm. Uh, great experience. Very happy with the way the match went, except for the finish, and changed my career from a physical aspect. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, you, you may have the dates there. That's been, that's been a couple, three years ago. Something like that, I believe it's been, yeah. And, oh, and I – I don't think I will ever recover physically from the last bump of that match. I mean, it, my back has never been the same and will never be the same again. And that's my, Hey, I, it, the first ladder didn't hurt landing on the second ladder that I didn't know was there was the one that did the damage. And again, my own fault, right? I didn't, I'm the one that dropped the ladder there, but it's uh, very happy with the match. Not so happy with the, the way the finish at the end. Gotcha. Okay. So now we're obviously going into, uh, you know, the full-fledged Billy Corgan era, the NWA, and Power comes on, and he's bringing back studio wrestling. Uh, when you heard the concept of Power and that Billy Corgan was bringing studio wrestling back to uh, television, or in this case, YouTube, what did you think? At this point, I had been with, uh, with Billy and Dave and the NWA long enough that I just trusted them, mm -hmm. right? I don't... I, you know, they're from the very beginning, the way they've approached all this was under promise and over deliver. Right. Right. So when they started talking about studio wrestling, that's what I grew up on. So I had a, I had a good concept of what that meant, but I know that the day that I walked into that building for the first time, it exceeded mine and everybody else's expectations. And I, it, I was like a kid on Christmas uh, to, to walk down to walk down the, you know, the aisles, elevated aisles, and to see the, the, the blue and gold, uh, you know, ring aprons, to see the flags hanging, to see the podium. And, and David, David kind of sent me some, some sneak peeks as far as, um, you know, here's kind of what we're expecting. And it was a combination of old school and new school, right? But to walk down there, the feeling that I had, it was amazing. And I've made this statement for a long time. I felt like I was kind of with the NWA. I felt like I was a guy that was waving the NWA flag by myself and a couple of friends. And I don't want to say keeping it alive. We just, we were the NWA guys. And I thought that once I got there, I realized that, um, man, every, every man and woman that walked into that building that night or that day for the, for the TV tapings, Mm -hmm. had the same reaction and that's every everybody from 
guys who have been wrestling for for a long time and everybody on this you know, you know that's listening knows uh, Jim Cornette who'd been in wrestling for 40 years we all had the same reaction and for me it still is like I'm home you know I mean we and it, it's it was just an amazing thing so I didn't know what to expect from studio wrestling I didn't know how the crowd would react I didn't know I didn't know how fans would react which has been the biggest thing and I don't mean like the in-studio fans but the response we got to NWA Power, uh, I, it exceeded every expectation. Yeah, I remember seeing, like, when I started seeing the pictures and the preview videos and the trailers and stuff, I got giddy. Because, like I said, again, I'm a fan, huge fan of old school wrestling. And I grew up, I think studio wrestling had kind of already passed on when I started getting into wrestling, but going back, you know, via the WWE Network and seeing tapes and DVDs and stuff and just really – I really enjoyed and loved the intimacy that the studio studio wrestling right. provided and that just seeing the setup and stuff, it just, it brought, brought all that back to me. And it's just, it has yeah. not disappointed since it's been on. Um, so now, you know, uh, everybody pretty much is aware that, you know, this whole pandemic thing has really changed a lot of things and affected just about every wrestling company in the world. Um, how has that, how has the pandemic affected, uh, not only your cr professional career, but also the NWA, like what, what, what's going on right now? On a personal level. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to bring it down. I don't bring the show down, but from a personal level, you know, I've looked at this. Um, I, I've never for a long time. I don't know how much longer I've said, I don't know how much longer I have in the business. I don't. And I still don't. Mm. I have no plans right now of being done. But let's, let's say, for example, if I had said I have a year left when this year started, the pandemic has stolen six months of, of my career, which, you know, half the career that I may have left. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be bitter about that because it's, you know, it's, it's not under anybody's control. It's just what it is. Exactly. From, a ref, from a big wrestling standpoint, um, I was saying back in January on, on interviews that, this was one of the best times I've ever seen in wrestling as far as opportunity. And as far as being a fan, if you're, if you're a wrestler, you had more places to choose to work, which is what we need as wrestlers mm -hmm. than, than in any time I've known in, you know, in 20 years, as a fan, you had more options and more choices to, uh, you know, to watch wrestling. And I, and I'm that guy that I want everybody to succeed. You know, I want every, anybody who loves wrestling, enough to get out there and do it. I want them to be successful. Every promotion, I'm never going to bash another promotion. Uh, I want them to succeed. Well, look what, look where we're at now. You know, I mean, the, the, the big two or three are, are struggling to, you know, to, to make it work and they're trying to find ways. And I think in the big picture, they're losing some of the fan base just because I don't think anybody realized we, we never thought about what it's like, to not have you know, fans at a live event from an NWA standpoint. I know that next week, I think next Tuesday, I think it's the 15th uh, will be the first of any type coming back. Uh, the NWA has, has teamed with championship wrestling from Hollywood uh, with, I think it's a promotion a studio called thunder that they're going to, they're going to be running a pay-per-view in conjunction with several other entities, which anything at this point is a positive because we had such good momentum, you know, uh, that now has gone. And, you know, Billy, Billy's statement from the beginning has, has been, we want to come back when it's safe for the fans and when it's safe for the wrestlers. And, you know, obviously he's sticking by that because that's the smart thing to do. Well, I can't wait for that to happen because I was actually having a discussion with uh, my friend Greg, who's a huge NWA fan about making a road trip to uh, some tapings once you guys, you know, are back, you know, back doing the studio shows and that. So I definitely hope that comes sooner rather than later. Um, so I know the a lot of people know, but I don't think everybody knows. And you, you made a couple of allusions, you may alluded to it a couple of times that your day job is that you are a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously this pandemic has not, has, you know, brought a lot of, you know, brought forth a lot of, uh, challenging times for all the teachers out there. Um, what are you doing to like, like ba basically make it as easy as possible for you to do, do your job under these current conditions? 
I think teachers across the U S right now, it's a challenge and everybody's in a different situation. Um, my personal situation was, I think we shut down the second week of March and mm -hmm. didn't go back for the rest of the, you know, for the rest of last year, that was a challenge. Um, I think my gift as a teacher, the thing I do well is I do I have good classroom management. I stand up in front of kids. I try to connect with them. I try to communicate with them. All that was gone. You know, my weakness as a teacher was I avoided technology and I did, you know, sometimes I did that on purpose. Well, now all of a sudden my job is not to manage a classroom or to stand up and talk. It's technology. Right. So right. out of completely out of my comfort zone. Um, this year we came back and I have now been at school, I don't know, three and a half weeks, something like that, maybe four, all online. But I'm sitting in my classroom doing online teaching. Um, I, I'm more comfortable. You know, I'm, I've, I've kind of got, I understand what my job is and I do the best I can. Next week, kids will show up, the ones that are choosing uh, traditional is what it's being called now, traditional learning, will show up for the first time next next Tuesday will be our first day of school with kids in class. I've got mixed feelings. I, you know, I think the way on the, on the whole pandemic thing, there's no good answer. You know, there's no, here's what has to happen. Right. Uh, I think the most, from a teaching you know, aspect, I think many people, including myself, I was, I would not learn well if I were looking at a computer, I need to be in class and I need to hear things and see things and hands on, I think that's a better way to learn. So from that aspect, I think kids need to be in school. On the other, other side of that is, how are we gonna protect our students uh, with, you know, with COVID? I'm now 56, you know, how do you, I'm, I'm in that danger zone now. Mm. Uh, if I've got 140 kids a day that I'm coming into contact with, how do I protect myself? And, and the answer to all that is, uh, I'm, I show up and I do my job and I'm gonna teach to the best of my ability and I'm gonna do everything I can to protect them and protect myself. And, you know, like, like we just, we'll just roll and see how it goes. Cause that's, that's what I got to do. And it's just you did a lot of the, uh, and I appreciate you being a little bit, you know, open about that because a lot of the concerns that you have, you know, I also have, because I have, I'm a father myself. I have a five-year-old little boy um, who, who just is doing distance learning right now. He just started kindergarten. Uh, my wife is actually a school bus driver. So, you know, she has, sees a lot of the same concerns and that kind of thing and stuff and I just I just I want to not only thank you for what you're doing for your kids but to all the teachers out there listening thank you for you know sticking with it thank you for you know doing the best you can to educate our youth because we need it now more than ever um one of the things I'm gonna go back again to uh the 10 pounds of gold and this is probably one of my favorite things that I, I saw throughout what I've seen so far and that was when you were the champion you had the belt on your desk what, 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 what was it like, you know, when the kids would walk into your classroom and they'd see that belt, what, 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 what were some of like the, the reactions they had? Well, let me, I guess I, I, this may be a disappointing answer for you. Um, I, I really work hard at trying to keep those worlds separate. Okay. So, so I don't think, I think there might have been one day uh -huh. when I had, um, I'm, I, I may have taken that belt one day along with, another title that I had that was the Indie World Championship that Harley Race, I won with Harley Race. But mm -hmm. um, for the most part, I don't think the kids have ever walked in and seen that belt on my desk. Okay. I, it's, oh, okay. I mean, here's, here's the thing for me. I, I believe teaching is, is very important. And mm -hmm. I am not afraid to use the wrestling connection if I think it will connect with a kid. But in most cases, 98% of the cases, if I allow them to start talking about wrestling, we're done for the day on history, right? So I, 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 I separate the two. Uh, I'm not a, I, I tell them what I do at the beginning, and I also tell them, but we're probably not going to talk about that in class. Uh, if you want to talk to me after class, I'll, you know, I'll try to answer your questions. But this is U.S. history, and in here I'm not Tim Storm, I'm Tim Scoggins. And I want you to focus on that. And, and the other part is I won't even show pictures. Uh, you know, my joke is in my mind, the worst thing I can do is to show a classroom full of 13 or 14 year olds, me in a pair of wrestling trunks. <laughs> that is, I'm just saying, regardless of what kind of shape I'm in, 
that is not what they need to be picturing when I'm teaching the constitution or the declaration, you know, it's yeah. it, Mr. Scoggins is there and that's, that's my job there. And then on the weekends, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to be a wrestler in the week. I'm not ashamed to be a teacher on the weekends, mm. but you know, I separate those two as clearly as I can. Gotcha. Um, so, Oh God, I'm just trying to think here. Um, so what did you, uh, anything that you've learned like throughout all the years as being a professional wrestler, were there anything that you learned that you turned around and used to apply to your uh, job as a teacher? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a couple of things, you know, I think, especially as I have gotten older uh, in the ring, I've, I've kind of my, I guess what I'm known for now as much as anything is my promos. Mm. And, and in essence, when you stand up in front of a classroom full of kids and you start talking about something you're passionate about, you're basically cutting a promo. And there, you know, I don't know which feeds the other. You know, I don't know when I'm cutting a promo, uh, the teacher in me comes out. But when I'm teaching, sometimes the wrestler comes out. And, I, and it's just like when you're when you connect with an audience and you're telling, you know, you're, you're cutting a promo about something and you're passionate about it, you can feel that audience. And the same thing with the classroom. If I'm, if I'm talking about something and I'm saying, you know, this is what that means and this is why it's important, you know if you've got them or not, right? You know you've connected. Mm -hmm. And the other, you know, people don't know this, uh, but I've I worked Hill for a really long time. and uh, I'm not uh, – I work heel more as a teacher than I do face. So I am, I am not afraid to go into, uh, you know, heel Tim storm mode if I need to with a student, if I, you know, if I need to, you know, it's, it's kind of a running joke with teachers. If you got to give them the teacher look or, you know, the teacher stare, you know, I'm not afraid to lead in and, and go, are we developing a problem here? Ooh, I just got chills. You know, so, I mean, but I'm just saying it's, that's, that's a crossover. You can do those with both because, Hey, if you're standing in the ring with a guy who's seven foot, 400 pounds and you can't back down, you better believe what you're saying. Right. I mean, I'm just, yeah, there's, a yeah. cross, there's a cross over there. Gotcha. So a couple more questions here and we'll wrap it up. Uh, if you could have a match against any former NWA champion in, in his prime, I think I know who your answer is going to be, but I still want you to answer it. Um, who would it be and why? <laughs> I could throw you a curveball here. Uh, if you, Please. Well, here's the curveball. Um, give me Nick Aldis for the title because I want to win it again. Ooh, I was definitely not expecting that, but I but like here's, here's Here's the answer that you were expecting, and you're right, by the way. Uh, give me Dusty Rhodes. Give me a bull rope match in front of 20,000 people in the Superdome uh, in his prime. And – you know, it doesn't have to be a bull roll match. It doesn't have to be gimmick, but I, I don't think there has, there's very few people who are as great of an entertainer as Dusty Rhodes uh, in his prime. And I told you that I connected with him pretty early on. That would be, that would be a lot of fun. I could imagine that. Yeah. And you just talked about how I think Dusty's probably, I would, I would consider him. And I know a lot of people would agree. He's probably the greatest baby face uh, wrestling's ever seen. Yeah, with that, with, I mean, there are guys that you could make an argument for, right? I, but but as a as a fan growing up, I completely agree with that. I mean, I don't. Anytime you start making a list, you're going to leave people off that deserve it, you know. But right. there's there's a lot of people that that Ricky Morton's one of the greatest baby faces of all time, oh, you know. Amazing. But I'm just, I, but I, there's a list there that you could make. But man, you know, give me give me Dusty and his prime, and I'll I'll work Hill just to, to get the experience. I mean, just to get it because. You know, he's, he was just, he was, he was all charisma. I, I loved it. Yeah, he was. All right. So my last question is, is how's mama storm doing? Appreciate you asking. Uh, she's doing good. You know, it's mom is 95. Uh, God bless she'll, her. 90, she'll be 96 this year. God bless her. Um, and her term all the time is when I, cause I talk to her every day mm -hmm. and her term all the time, mom, how are you feeling today? You know, I just don't have any steam. That's what she says. And then she'll usually follow it up with, I guess that's what, I guess that's how you feel when you're almost a hundred, right? So she's doing well. The doctors continue to tell her how healthy and how great she's doing. Mm -hmm. And then she'll always follow that up with, but I don't feel like I'm doing great. She, she doesn't understand what 95 should feel like. She thinks she ought to feel like she's 50 or 60. Um, I haven't gotten to see her much. Uh, it's, yeah. it, it's not just me. It's I'm, everybody out there that has a, an older loved one is it's the struggle. It is. Um, 
you know, especially as a teacher, my summers is when I could spend time with her. But if I take something there and she catches it at 95, then I don't know. I don't know how I could live with that. Right. So, right. so I, I, agree. Her much. Um, I actually went last weekend and I wanted to, I wanted to spend time with her before my students came back. Cause I feel at that point that I'm, I'm more exposed, which would be her more exposed. Right. Uh, but she continues to amaze me, amaze the world. She is, she's healthy for 95. Uh, she's smart. She's sharp. You know, she doesn't think she is, but I, I tell her every day she is. She's, she's a wonderful lady. She's my hero. And I, I love hearing the real kind of relationship that you have with your mom, because I, I feel I have the same type of relationship with my mom. I mean, I try to talk to her as every day as much as possible and stuff. Um, when, okay. So this is actually, I do have a couple more questions here. What, what, what did it feel like the first time you heard a mama storm chant? <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm a big believer. Okay. Another dusty thing. Mm. Uh, Dusty is, is, has, has said that you shouldn't rehearse your promos because that's, and that, and I don't rehearse. Now, I have an idea of what I want to say, but you don't, if you rehearse your promos over and over and over, you lose the, the, the true emotion, the, the passion of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that, my, that promo was kind of an ode to Dusty because Dusty always used to talk about, you know, his mom, right? I mean, son mm -hmm. of a plumber, but he was, so, when I, when I made that comment, because I've gone back and watched it, you know, I paused for a second, not expecting any reaction at all, right? So, and, and you know, you learn in wrestling. If you do something in the ring and the crowd responds, you give it a minute to breathe. And, well, the crowd responded, and I start to talk, and it grows. So I get quiet, and it grows. And I know that I, I finished the promo out. I got in the ring, and it was, it was, it was with mixed – mixed feelings on my part. And here's what I mean. Um, I think I got in the ring. I think Brian, Oh, it was against Nick. So Brian Hebner was the ref. And I think I walked over to Brian and the crowd was chanting mama storm. And I, I think I said something to be funny. Like, am I going to, am I going to regret that? You know, is <laughs> I, somehow I just put my mom over bigger than myself. And then, you know, as working a match, when you're, when you're hurt and you're into, you know, well, you know, the deal, if you, but if you're getting beat up, what you really want is for them to cheer you, right? Right. What I got was Mama Storm. They're cheering for my mom. And and, and I get that because what they're thinking is if my mother is my motivation, they're going to motivate me, right? So right. it was – I wish that I could tell you, you know what, Dennis, I, I went into this with a plan. And I knew that when I said that, the crowd, you know, I had no clue. I just go out there and speak my heart. And uh, the crowd connected with it, thank goodness. And, you know, thankfully for them, they made it something because it was just, it was something I said and they, they made it, they, they brought that to life. I love that. Uh, now, what was Mama Storm's reaction to when she first heard the Mama Storm chant? I'm very protective of my mom. Um, okay. So what I mean by that is like, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to, she doesn't like to see me get hurt. Right. So she, she's not interested in watching a lot of the matches. Okay. Uh, I played her the Mama Storm chant and showed her the Mama Storm pin, and I got her a shirt. And even like this last behind you, yeah. Well, and, and even this last weekend, it was funny because um, I was talking to her, and I had just done an interview uh, with with two guys from Yorkshire, England, who had who brought up Mama Storm, mm -hmm. and I was on Twitter, um, and a. a, a this, a friend of mine, a lady from Scotland had bought a mama storm shirt. So I was sitting there and I was going, mom, you're not gonna believe this, but you know, you've got these two guys in England, you know, and there's an England, Arkansas. So I had to clarify, mom, there's <laughs> these two guys in Yorkshire, England, um, uh, that wanted me to tell you hi. And I want to show you this picture because this lady from Scotland bought your shirt. And you know, my mom grew up in Oklahoma, Arkansas, a population of like 82 or something. And, and she goes, you mean like people, other places know who I am? You know, and I'm like, I said, mom, you don't, you have millions of fans. You just don't know it. And she goes, okay, I believe you, but I just don't, she has, she doesn't get the concept. You know, it's, uh, she's not a wrestling fan. She wishes that I would stop doing it because she's afraid her baby's going to get hurt. So, mm -hmm. uh, she, but she, she always says, well, tell them I love them too. 
So that's pretty much the response I get on those. That's awesome. All right. So uh, one more thing and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, how can uh, people reach you in, on social media and also where can people go to buy Tim Storm merchandise? Uh, the best way for merchandise and boy, I, you know, I probably should do something different, but you go to the NWA uh, website and they've got, they've got sh two different shirts. They've got the pins. They've got, uh, I think there's probably trading cards or something coming out. I mean, there's, there's a lot of merch there. Um, I wish I could tell you to just send it to me and I'd take care of it, but I probably won't. So, you know, it's better that I do it the right way. <laughs> uh, Tim storm. Oh, one mm -hmm. uh, on Instagram and Tim storm NWA on uh, Twitter can usually find me on there's, you know, there's Tim storm on Facebook. Uh, but to be honest, I think I've got 5,000 people and can't take any more. So no, I probably won't see it on there, but you know, any of those, you can find me. Um, you know, I just appreciate fans. I try to respond when I can. And I, it, the fact that somebody cares is a big deal. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest with you. I just, me trying reaching out to you to do this was just, you know what? You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So I'm going to take this one. And then when I heard back from you, I was just blown away. So I just, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time just to respond to me. And uh, I also want to thank you for taking time out of your day to chat with me this evening. It's been a lot of fun and I just, I can't thank you enough for doing this for me. Well, I, first of all, let me give credit to uh, my friend in New York who said, Hey, you should add your, uh, email to Twitter so people get in touch with you. I had never done that before. So, you know, she knows who she is for that. And yeah, it, like I said, man, we're all in this together, especially during this COVID thing. We need to, this thing needs to go away. We need to get back to wrestling the way it was. So we can all enjoy it. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've enjoyed it. And Hey man, let's everybody out there support wrestling, support promotions near you. Uh, buy the guys merch that they're, they are passionate about what they do. It's a, it's a sacrifice physically support local wrestling, uh, support, support guys like this that are out there promoting it and trying to make it a better place. So I appreciate you having me on and I enjoyed every, every second of it. Awesome. Well, Tim, uh, once again, thanks again and have a great evening. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time. Thanks again to Tim Storm for taking time out of his day to sit down and talk with me. I really enjoyed what he had to say, and I thought his uh, perspectives on teaching were really good. Uh, it was a huge honor to get Tim on here, as I've become a really huge fan of his after following his story on the 10 Pounds of Gold series, as well as NWA Power. Uh, you can get the DVDs at the NWA shop. You can also get your Tim Storm merch there as well, including the Mama Storm shirt. Or you can view the uh, end episodes of NWA Power and the 10 Pounds of Gold series on their channel on YouTube. Uh, for my shout-out tonight, I am going to give a special shout-out to all of the teachers out there. Because without you right now, our kids wouldn't have anyone to educate them. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for putting your lives on the line, especially in this day and age with this pandemic. And keep doing your thing because uh, I fully support you. The What Do You Say With DDJ show is a proud supporter of all the teachers out there. Uh, one last thing before we go, uh, Tim Storm has a message he would like to deliver to all of you. And after that, have a great night. This is Tim Storm, former NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. You're listening to What Do You Say with DDJ. If you love professional wrestling, this is where you need to get your information. Don't miss this.